So I think that I'm going to take that this the this road up a little bit, the mountain a little smaller, and start pulling into that sky. And our guest today is Shanna Kuntz. And you're going to do something that's just completely unethical and completely unheard of. Tell, tell me what you're going to do. Well, I'm pretty good at doing things that are unheard of and taking chances. We are going to do what I call a search and destroy. Search and destroy. A take a mediocre painting, one that I'm happy with, but not necessarily. It doesn't really speak to me. We're all afraid to learn. Every single painting is something that we um, build up this anxiety for, and we want it to be perfect. Sometimes we need to play. And when I do a search and destroy, it is all about playing, and it's about going through and isolating in each painting. Hmm, what don't I like? How can I change this? What well, I am I not going to gonna like this. I, I am going to be like <laughs> freaking out because... Uh, I'll walk into your studio and I'll see the painting you're going to work on. And I'll say, I want that. I love that. And you're going to go, no, I hate no. it. I'm going to destroy it. <laughs> if it's a good thing. Then nobody can ever see the paintings that I don't like ever again. But All right. Well, they're going to be x-raying those paintings a hundred years from now or some new tech. Okay. Well, let's get this show started. Shanna, uh, let's search and destroy. Take it away. Search and destroy. So I did this piece, I've actually done this. This is um, a scene that I have done from a little place called Salmon, Idaho, which is a little teeny tiny town. And I've done it as a large piece and I got really great sensitivities and subtleties in the large piece. And I kind of did it as a demo for a small piece and it, I'm, I'm just not thrilled with it. It's okay, but it doesn't work. We are all trying to learn, we're trying to, um, put in all the elements and design of art that we can, but it's really scary when you're working on a brand new piece that you have such high expectations for. So this is a piece I have no expectations for except for to destroy it, and I'm going to have a great time doing it. So I make decisions as I go. I think that there's a little too much contrast for my little sensitive um, touch. So I'm going to, first of all, Oh, no! Yeah, I'm gonna sand. What are, what are you down. sanding with? This is just some sandpaper, but sometimes I take my electric sander to them too. What I don't want is a lot of um, high points in in this as I'm searching destroying. When you so say high just, points, you mean paint sticking up? Yeah, paint sticking up, texture in there. Okay, so I'm really, gonna insert myself here for a second and just say one thing, Shanna. If you paint with lead paint, do not sand indoors and without a respirator. Absolutely. Right? And, Absolutely. And it probably is a good idea as a general practice. If you're using any, any heavy metals, cadmiums and so on, don't breathe that stuff. Okay. Wow. So when I'm working on a large piece and I have my electric sander, I am usually using some kind of face mask because I try to be aware of that. But most of my paints are... Um, transparent and I don't use a lot of cadmiums but let's just see what we can do so the one thing I know I've isolated out that I don't like it, it it is not sensitive enough it's got contrast here 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 so let's push that back can you articulate what that means not sensitive enough and too much contrast I like a piece that only has value contrast in just a few places. I love my favorite painter of all time is Twatman and all those delicate little color shifts and very little value changes. Just the, the temperature shifts are what really make his painting sing. And so you I want to keep your values very close together. Very compressed. Yes, always. I'm always looking for that. That's kind of my um, obsession with painting. So first thing I'm going to do is destroy. Normally I will destroy with a very transparent glaze like raw umber violet is my very favorite color. Daniel Smith is no longer carrying traditional oils so I'm heartbroken. 
Um, I just bought 20 tubes of it to make sure I have it for the rest of my life. Well, that's probably not um, enough. I know, I know. So I'm just going to take some paint and destroy as best as I can. But I still want to leave that ghost image. If you've ever done any printmaking, you know what a ghost image is. And I want to keep that the bones there so I know... I'm looking to keep the overall theme of the painting because I think I was onto something when I first started. I just think I got carried away. What I don't do is I don't pull the image back out. Uh, this is gonna be a in very intuitive painting. If I go back and look at the image, I'm probably gonna paint the same thing again. I know that's hard, but it takes m years and years of mileage um, to understand how to make spatial relationships work color relationships work. So I think I've had that those years of mileage. The one thing I didn't care about was I had tried to make a dramatic sky and it just was not working. So now let's take a little bit of that raw umber violet. And when I say destroy, the more I destroy, the better the painting is going to be. Are you um, are you thinking about, are there certain areas that I won't put that romb or violet, like in your lights, on your road, in your sky? Yes, there's areas that I'll leave isolated because this is going to be, after all, a very high key piece. I would like on my value range from a one to 10, I would like my value range, one being white, to be between a one and a five, and maybe some pops of six. So that's a very high value range. But what are you doing there? Some, Is that you're putting more paint on? I'm just destroying. <clears throat> I'm Destroy. just putting more paint and destroying and trying to get that sky. That was my biggest problem. And I had a beautiful moon in there because there was a moon that night. Shanna, but talk to us about um, this idea of making our paintings precious. You know, you're doing something, oh, what, you're, what yes. you're teaching here is something that's really critical because we, we sometimes invest so much time and we feel really good about something we've done. And yet if it's not right, uh, it's not right. And so uh, talk to us about um, overcoming that fear of screwing up something we've done so well. So the, the idea of precious, sometimes when we're working a painting, we find one little area that we fall so in love with that that's where our mind goes is just to that area. If something becomes so precious, then you're not going to be able to make the whole composition work because you're so stuck in one area. Usually if there's a place that is so precious to me, it's going to be the first place that I do destroy because I, I need to think of the whole composition coming together and all these parts playing together. If I have one part that's just too precious, it's just got to go. So I got to tell you a quick story. Um, my, I was working on a winter painting. As a matter of fact, it was a winter painting of something I had started when I painted with your best friend, Lori McNee. And, and uh, I, I was, I had done some trees and the trees were perfect. I loved those trees. And um, so my wife walks into the studio and she says, don't touch those trees. And so I'm working around the trees and I'm thinking something's not right. And I realized the trees were in the wrong place and it was just messing up the composition. And I just hung on to those trees and I couldn't get the composition right. Finally, I did what you did as I searched and destroyed and then everything came together and the painting was uh, a big seller immediately. So yes. you just never know. You never know. And I, it's, it's kind of, I, I, I compare it to life. We ourselves are made of layers and layers and layers and experience and experience. And we never know what those experiences and what those layers and different choices are going to lead to. But usually they lead to a 
more well-rounded, beautiful person. Well, I think of that in the same way as the painting. I know at this point, if I've destroyed it and I'm freaking out, I can wipe this off because it's it was dry. But it, this just gives me the permission to go in and play a little more. So the one thing I didn't like is the sky. I'm going to go back in and see if I can make this a little more precious, um, right. a, a little less precious, a, a little more subtle. And I might need to move my... How's that look? Uh, we're going to okay. put uh, Shanna's uh, uh, email, uh, uh, website in the comments. So, uh, And Shanna's got a wonderful thing she does with Liz Robbins, which is called um, Inspired to Paint, which is a mentorship program. So you might want to check that out, too. All right. What are you looking for? Okay. I am looking for subtleties. It, I know when I make the decision, I want this an overall very cool palette because it is snow. So my dominance is going to be cool. And then I'll put little pops of warm where it needs to be. Before, I think it was 50-50, warm and cool. And that doesn't work. I've got to really make a conscientious choice of what is going to be my dominant value, my dominant temperature, and my dominant shape. So I also noticed as I was painting it that many of my shapes are really close in size. So I think that I'm going to take that, this, the, this road up a little bit, the mountain a little smaller, and start pulling into that sky. So I've used some white and a little bit of Naples. And, I'm and, just and are you using any medium when you're throwing any of this paint on top? Not at this point. I will, as I'm building, I'll start using Neo McGilp as my very favorite medium. Right. It's got a nice viscosity to it. So I'm just going to start reevaluating what that sky is going to look like. And I want it to be quiet. I've got enough activity down here that I'm, I, I think that my sky before was competing with that activity. Um, so I'm going to get rid of that. I loved the idea of having some big billowy clouds in there before. And I ended up with just some layers of plain planes. And I wasn't quite happy. So let's take that edge. So fun because everything when you start um, destroying something, everything can become anew. I can change any line on it and, and I'm not freaking out because it doesn't look like a photo. I want everybody to pay close attention to what Shanna is doing with her brush. Um, you know, we have a tendency to, to hold our brushes like pencils and she is being very, <clears throat> very loose. It when loses you find control. your... When you find yourself painting like this, you're painting things. When you find yourself holding your brush, you're painting shapes. All right. And it is all about painting shapes. Hello, Sutton so, by the Sea, Lincolnshire, uh, UK. Welcome. Hello, Spain. Hello, San Miguel that. Diente. Let's bring that down even a little more. Now I have my, my background within watercolor and in watercolor gradation is so important in order because the pigment isn't as strong. We have to use gradation to create those spatial differences. So even with my oils, I become extremely aware of those gradations. Now I'm gonna... I want to do a shout out to Elizabeth Robbins, your partner who's watching. You've got great stuff that you guys have done together. And uh, again, we will post a link to your new Inspired to Paint. Um, uh, you and Elizabeth together have done so many great things for the art world and training people. You are rock stars. Thank you. We have fun. We really have a good time with our, with our course. Hello, Ireland. Going on. Going what? Three years now. We are going uh, on three years now. 
Okay, and then I just want that edge nice and soft. I don't want to be totally committed to it yet. Talk to us about um, edges. So some people, I, I look at it in two camps. Some people are mostly soft edges with a little bit of hard edge, and some people are really hard edge with a little bit of soft edge. And what that does is it helps create, move your eye through the entire painting. I'm kind of a soft kind of girl. And if you look at my um, paintings, the, those soft edges are really important to me. I'm trying to develop atmosphere. Um, and that's only one way. I love a hard edged painting. I love something that appears so confident that they can leave a hard edge in. Right now, I don't want to commit to something until some until an element in this painting starts speaking to me so i'm back to that same old where these shapes are awfully similar so i'm going to make some changes already i'm going to put that horizon line all the way back to the back and i want that mountain to be so uh soft and obscure now i don't all i don't usually work without a lot of without images um when i'm starting to create the piece uh, because i took the image i'm obviously in love with it or i wouldn't have sat there and painted it i do a lot of plain air pieces as well and use those for my studies but I'm not afraid to use technology either. I'm not afraid to um, use a no tan technology, filters, um, things to get me outside of this. Is, I had a professor when I went up to Utah State. He said, the tyranny of things as they appear, we all get so stuck on having to paint what we see, and especially in plain air. Plain air makes it even harder. There's so much information all around us and we have to pick and choose. Our job is to compose. Our job is to figure out what needs to stay and what needs to go. And it doesn't have to look like the image. We, we want, the whole purpose is a beautiful painting. So there's a question about acrylics. Uh, could you do this with acrylics? You, you, yes, you could, but acrylics dry, dry so fast that you probably would want to put extenders in them. I wish I had experience um, with the acrylics, but I really don't. Um, I was a watercolorist for many, many, many years. Um, that, in fact, I kind of built my career around, around watercolor. And so when I'm approaching my oil paintings, I'm doing quite a bit of the same. Hello, Mumbai, um, India. Woo. Namaste. Netherlands. India. Okay. So I'm going to now reestablish my directional elements through the painting, which meant the, the little path goes through here, through here, and I'm just putting some skeletal structures back in again. And that building might have to move up just a little bit. I think we need to put a skyscraper in there to just to, to yeah. really destroy. <laughs> I don't know if the people of Sam and Idaho would be thrilled with it. Oh, I don't think anybody yeah. would. <laughs> So that's interesting. Just to raise it up, you're just increasing the roof line. Yep, I'm just going to increase the roof line a little bit, put a little warmth in there. This is a great lesson. Shanna, you're such Not a good teacher. Nothing, nothing is precious. We're all learning. Every painting is about learning research. It's not about masterpieces. Every once in a while, a masterpiece happens from all of that learning. But if in, in our mind, we're thinking about everything as a lesson or a, a way to grow, our growth becomes exponential.
Now I do want to put something behind that building. Um, I'll use my beautiful burnt raw umber violet. Okay, for you acrylic people, uh, Vision Weaver, Vision Weaver says you can definitely do this painting with acrylic. I do it all the time. You use a little medium if you want, but my secret is just to keep spraying the paint to keep it wet. Okay, very good. I, I kind of started, I know this sounds like it isn't late, but I kind of feel like I started painting late in life, which was in my 30s. And I felt this, this overwhelming need for catch up my, my whole life, catching up, catching up, learning as fast as I can learn. And I am an avid art history if I wasn't a painter, that's what I would do is I would um, work for a museum or a curator because I love art history so much. I think that's really and, important for, for oh, so uh, artists I. to understand art history and to read about it. You learn so much from it. It's our craft. This is our craft. And if you want to be very good at our craft, you go to the masters, you look at the masters and you figure out why did they do what they do? And as soon as you do that, as soon as you start reading, George Ennis, of course, is another one of my, my idols of painting. Uh, most of the turn of century American painters are. As soon as you start doing that, it gives you permission to explore what you have to say. And each one of us has something very individual to say. And each one of us voices is really important. Um, finding your own voice, I think, is probably the best thing. Um, you talked about the idea of success. That is my idea of success, is having your own voice, your own interpretation, and your own way of expressing yourself. Hey, a shout out to Scott Jones, who's watching, one of, the, one of the great gallerists and one of the great guys in our industry. Hey, Scott. He was just in your Good. studio, I understand. Now, why did you put that dark line in there? I'm just kind of finding where the bones are. Oh. This is a an indigo blue. I'm trying to stay away from any bright blue, so I'm looking for grays. And I'm just trying to move the, the direction of your eye through the painting. Greetings from the cliffs of Mother Ireland. All right. Woo bucket list that's a bucket list for me yeah let's go together let's just get a group together we'll go over oh, i would love that there's somebody watching okay. from newfoundland and they can paint icebergs up there this time of year Ooh. okay i'm like i said i don't want to be so stuck on something Hey, everybody, go into the comments. You have a chance to win a prize anyway, but go into the comments and just type in what your primary medium is. Oil, watercolor, acrylic, wash, uh, pastel. Just go ahead and type in your primary. And actually, do this. Type in your primary and then put a slash and put your, your secondary, you know, like if you do oil first and then watercolor. All right, that's good. So I've, I've started using a little bit of cold wax in this painting uh, with Ooh. a little bit of Neoma Gilp. All of those Gamblin products go so beautifully together. So I'm going in with my palette knife to be to put in a few more really confident pa passes through. Put a little so you put some cold down. wax in, mixed it into your paint to make it thicker to, yes, to give it a little, little more viscosity to it. Uh -huh. I love a beautifully textured painting. Um, and I have found that I do, because I was a watercolorist for so many years, I have to play tricks on myself sometimes to put more paint down. Um, I have a tendency to be so, get so thin with it. And ooh, see that texture of that cold wax and a beautiful textural area. And I think I'm gonna take that off of the picture plane because I didn't like that before. That gives me a couple um, horizontal areas to work from. 
So I've got some beautiful little temperature things going on in this mountain, back in this back mountain. And what I've done, because I like to work in, a, in very compressed value ranges, I've made up a few piles of warms and cools that are in this exact same value. So I'm just going to put a few little, some of them are a little brighter, some of them are a little grayer. But I'm just going to play and say, hmm, which, which one is working better for me? And you're going to so do it with a palette little, knife. I'm going to do it with a palette knife. I love the texture of it. When I'm working on something precious that I think is precious, uh, I'm not using the palette knife quite as much. So I take the chance, right, with, the, with these search and destroys, this is where I take my risks. This is where I decide I'm going to try something different. I'm going to get a little more contemporary uh, with my piece. This is a definitely a more gray in here. And I just, that kind of thrills me to have those color shifts in that back, back mountain. And I don't want that mountain to be really important. So this is a definitely an area I can play a little more. There's that beautiful gray. So this is a snow covered mountain. And there will be definitely areas um, where the, there's plane changes. But for right now, I'm just looking at this as a shape. I'm building beautiful temperature shifts, texture, and keeping those values compressed. And then I'll go back in and put the detail. I truly believe that 90% of your painting should be just about shapes, just about composition, making a beautiful composition. And then the last 10% should be about detail. I'm loving this. This is it's just so fun. It is really fun to play. Um, and if everything is precious, you're not learning how that beautiful palette knife edge will scrape across the palette and bring out these beautiful edges. You guys, so. there's a link in the um, in the comments to it's uh, shannakunst.com. You can go see her work. You can find out about her mentoring program, Inspired to Paint, with she and Elizabeth Robbins. Uh, they do a lot, and you should check it out. They're good people. Wait, the one thing that was really important to me with, with our course was the art history, because I think that it's so important to find your voice, and through art history, you're allowed to find your voice. Let's see what happens if I decide I'm going to put the... Yeah, that's a great idea. And and by the way, I, I haven't announced this yet publicly, but uh, there's going to be an announcement going out in the next day or two. I'm going to be doing a, uh, a webinar, a 90 minute webinar with three top artists about finding your voice. So uh, opportunity to plug that. So important. Everybody's, everyone's voice is so important. Yes, we have to put the miles in. You have to do the painting before that starts to happen. But it is so important to find what you have to say. Now, I try and find areas where I can bring those shapes together and create a, an area that moves so I can move, keep moving the eye through, knowing that I'll be able to make this work. It takes so much faith, as in life. One of these search and destroys is so comparative to life. It takes faith to put something down that you know it has to be there, but it doesn't quite look right yet. Yeah. You just just know that keep at it, keep working at it. It's going to happen. Nothing's precious. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what that what you're going to do there. This, yeah, this is just as ways of, of movement to get through the painting. And then I think I'm going to carve behind and build a couple more um, buildings. Oh, okay. There's a little, little building here. Okay, so we have an assignment for everybody watching. Everyone watching, no matter what your medium is, 
what I want you to do is to dis- search and destroy a painting as soon as they're your next opportunity to paint. Go find one that you don't feel so precious about and just go in and start messing it. All right. Uh, what who's have you in? Got to lose? Right. I, I want what you to you put a comment in that says, I'll do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah, you have nothing to lose. A painting you know, what you've done the- here is you made that scene, already you made that scene cozier because it's now it feels like a village and I want to be there. Yes. Before it felt isolated. Like it did. Here in, I'm in my and little I- house all by myself. I don't want to define too thoroughly what I want you to see, you know, part of the, the most wonderful pieces of art. And if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Twatman's work, please go look at his work. Uh, he just puts little suggestions here and there throughout the painting that say, oh, this could be this, this could be this, but your eye is moving through the whole thing. Start putting some of these colors down in here. And I'm not, I'm not completely um, decisive of how those are going to, how that path is going to be, but I got a pretty good idea. If we don't play, we don't learn. That's right. Yummy, looking good. That's enough to let you know there's a building right there. And you know, I think I need, because I've got one on this side and one on this side, I think for balance, this is intuitively, I'm thinking maybe a little more over here. So I've got a nicer grouping. All right, everybody, I'm gonna just, sorry to interrupt you. I'm gonna show everybody a Twachtman painting and it's, it's not a, not the same, but it's a little village. You can get a feel for how compressed his values are. Look at that beautiful sky up in there and those gentle color shifts. And that sky is not fighting it. And that mountain in the background no. isn't fighting it. And he's brought a lot of it's that color so from the sky down in it. Really nice. So quiet. Okay. And you know, I know everybody loves color. Um, I understand that, but you also have to paint who you are um, and what, what um, your obsession is. <laughs> well, the one thing that and was I, a tough lesson for me to learn was the importance of gray. Oh, absolutely. And I think I need a little bit of those beautiful winter willows. I have to tell this story real quickly. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Helena wants from Sweden says, Oh, you must visit the home of Anders Zorn. When you travel to Sweden, Mr. Zorn was very high tech for his time. And the first one to install a telephone in his town of Mora, his number one, that was his phone number. Never heard that story. (laughs) Well, some of us can remember when there were only seven digits in a telephone number. But if I keep talking, I'll should tell my age. So. Well, you do have like a million grandkids. I do have a million grandkids. Best part of life. <laughs> Best part of life. Okay, you I'm gonna go back to your that. age. You know, I worked really hard. Um, and enjoyed it, of course, every minute of it, but I, I am proud of that. Now, let's Do you have any way to get your camera any closer so we can now kind of get a, I sh- a little I sure feel do. for that? I sure do. 
Looks like it's Dennis Marshall's birthday. Happy birthday. So when I started this painting, I knew it would be a limited palette of complementary colors. And I'm kind of sticking with that same idea. This is blues and oranges to me. Uh, and I do mostly work with a limited palette because I find that my grays are so much more um, alive. For the newbies who might not know what that means, what is your limited palette? How many colors? I get to choose what that is. That's the, that's the great thing about composing is you get to decide what that's going to be. I've done extensive study on color theory. Uh, Joseph Albers color theory is probably my favorite because it's putting what happens when you put one color against another color, the, the push and pull. But when I'm using a limited palette, I'm trying to um, use tertiary colors in, in whatever forms they are, whatever grays I can make out of it. This particular piece has indigo and a little bit of ultramarine blue. And then I've used uh, quinacridone violet as my red. And then I've got raw sienna uh, and white and a little bit of Naples as my yellow. And it's made these beautiful tertiary colors in here, but it's still given me the ability to put bright in where I want them to be. Yep. I think we should auction it off right now. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Well, let me finish it. Then yeah, you, well, then you can. We get, see if we get any bidders. Somebody told me that they were a student of Albers, uh, that he was their, um, their college instructor. I don't remember who told me that. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? You never know. Sometimes these people are legends, but they're, you know, they're different in person. Well, and I love contemporary. Work. <laughs> Elizabeth I, Robin says, I get first dibs. <laughs> <laughs> you guys no, still have that do. gallery in Ogden? We do not. We, we, it, we had a great time for five years. It was wonderful. We learned all about hanging art, selling art, talking to people. Um, and we loved introducing art to our community. Our community not, has not been really um, art educated, even though we have really great universities around here. Um, we had a ball with it, but both of us are traveling a lot. Liz um, travels to teach a lot. And I was at the time doing a lot of plein air shows and keeping hours was just miserable for both of us. Oh, we oh. sure met, we met some amazing people. We carried some amazing people. Um, it was really fun. But when, we, when it was time was done, we were done. Yeah, well, nobody realizes how hard that life is. You know, anything retail is hard, but the gallery business is tough. There are some people who have the, uh, well, I was going to use a different word, but they have the, the, the right attitude about it. And some people, it's just like, Oh, it's annoying. You know, there's a lot of cost. People, the artists don't understand what gallerists go through. Well, and a lot of responsibility. Oh, yeah. We, we were so conscientious about the artists that we, that we carried um, that if we weren't selling for them, and, you know, that happens. If we weren't selling for them, we felt so um, responsible for that. Yeah. So. All right. So now, we are at, uh, we, we probably need to wrap up within about three minutes. This is absolutely okay. completely changed. I wish we had done a screenshot of the before so we could see what it looked like before for those people who didn't see that came in late. You'll have to watch the replay and see how she just completely searched and destroyed uh, and made this such a beautiful painting. You've got such a great thing going here. And I, and, and I had fun. I played. Now, this, it also um, instilled my belief in faith. And we need faith in every part of our life. Faith that things are going to turn out. 
and especially in a painting. You have to have some faith that if given enough time and given enough good decisions and given enough time to play, it's going to turn out. So when I when this is all finished, because it's still I'm still playing. Why don't you come back fun. on camera? Back up the camera a little bit so we can see you. Okay. All right. Because we want to um, see you. And somebody was commenting about your hair. Oh, <laughs> they loved you. it. And I'm I'm very demonstrative when I paint. When I when I'm talking. When this is all done, I know I'm going to like it because guess what? If I don't, it becomes another search and destroy. And in the meantime, I've learned so much from it. I've learned brushwork. I've learned temperature shifts. I've learned composition. I've learned so many things um, that I probably wouldn't take those risks if it were a painting that I knew was going to go straight out to a gallery if I'm on a deadline and I know I've got to send 10 paintings to this gallery or eight paintings to this gallery. I'm not going to take those chances. But if I can take one of these and play I know I'm going to learn something from every one of them, and I have enough faith that it'll come out. Well, that, that was it, a great lesson, and, and uh, you, you had a beautiful painting, but you've got a much more beautiful painting now, so congratulations. I want Thank to remind you. everybody that we posted the link to Shanna's website, and uh, on there you can find out about her teaching and mentoring and other things, and buy her paintings. That's always nice. And Shanna, yes, thank you so nice. much for being on today. You're truly an inspiration. You're, thank you uh, for inviting me. Really, really an accomplished painter. I'm so impressed with what you've accomplished. I know it's been lots and lots of hard work, years of hard work yeah. and dedication, and that's what it takes. Yes, it is. It's what it takes. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, any we final love words? every minute of it. Um, I have a workshop in Scottsdale in October, so check out Scottsdale Fine Art School. Uh, okay, guys, let's I'll tell that out today. Let's just get it sold out so she doesn't have to talk about it to anybody anymore. <laughs> and I'll be doing school. a plein air show in Bozeman in a week and a half for the Bozeman Art Museum. That's going to be a great event. That'll be awesome. so much fun. And yes. uh, you're going to be on plein air live. Yes, I am. Coming up uh, in next next year. So that's exciting. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Shannon. And uh, really, really appreciate you doing this. Yeah.